What's this we're hearing so much about separation of church and state? There's nothing in the Constitution about it. But what does the Bible say? It does have something to say. Stay tuned and we'll see because we need to know what it says, don't you think? I know the Lord will find a way for me. In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe the Bible is a revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. A hearty welcome to you, my friend, to our Bible study program, In Search of the Lord's Way. And we pray we'll both be blessed by our study of God's Word together. I guess there's always been a question about the Christian's relationship to government. It must have been so way back in the first century even because Jesus was confronted with it during His early, earthly ministry. And the writers of the New Testament epistles addressed the subject too, which would indicate their encounter with the question. And the Apostle Paul repeatedly appealed to his Roman citizenship for protection under the law. And an example of that is in Acts chapter 22, verse 25. Some people believe in something being called a wall of separation between church and state, which in their estimate forbids Christian participation in government. They'd be surprised to learn, however, that the word church doesn't even appear in the U.S. Constitution, nor does the word wall. But the idea is frequently used to intimidate Christians from participation in the processes of government. There are also some professed disciples of the Lord who believe that the Scriptures forbid their uh, participation, even participation to the point of voting, so that the full impact of Christian influence is not felt, even in a government said to be of the people and by the people and for the people. If Christian people can be led or frightened into non-involvement, others can pretty well have their way, can't they? And no one would be surprised that in such a void of Christian influence, the nation would suffer a downturn in Christian morals and ethics. Well, do Christians have the same rights and responsibilities under the Constitution that others have? Well, just as it's always been, it's a topic of current interest. And uh, we'll leave the constitutional and the political side of the debate to others. But we are going to inform ourselves on what the Scriptures teach. We're calling today's message Separation of Church and State. Ken Healthbrand's going to lead us in a hymn, and then I'll be back for Bible reading and prayer. We're reading today from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22. We begin reading at verse 15 and read through verse 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him, that is Jesus, in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. 
And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. And now let us go to God in prayer. Almighty and all-loving God, we believe and know from your word that you are the ruler of heaven and earth and that nothing is done here on this earth without your knowledge. So we thank you for permitting us to be citizens of this great country. We believe most confidently that this nation came into being and that it exists through your providence. Its continuance depends upon your providential care. Because we've departed so far from our roots and so far from your teachings, we pray that we may inspire a spirit of repentance in our nation and that we may continue to enjoy freedom and prosperity here and that we may continue with our children and our grandchildren and generations yet unborn to enjoy it. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. New Testament Christianity is not political. The perpetuity of the Lord's church doesn't depend on any form of government or any certain people in places of authority in government. History records some of the periods of greatest church expansion under, to be under some of the most tyrannical forms of government and during the reigns of some of the world's most abusive and oppressive despots. You can count on it. Every church of Christ has within its membership people of all political persuasions whose love for Christ and for one another bridges all political differences and brings them together in one spiritual body in Christ. However, there are some issues on which our form of government seeks the input of all its citizens. Christians are not, whether they're Christians or not, they are sought for their information or for their input. These are moral issues, and the church's advocacy for Christian morality is not political. It rises above that to cross party lines. It's a statement for Christ and his way of life. But what of the Christian who's a citizen of the U.S.? What are his rights, responsibilities to the government? That's what we're talking about today. Jesus defined those things in the passage we read a moment ago. The scripture says that the common people heard Jesus gladly, Mark 12, 37. But their leaders saw him as a threat. So this passage says the Pharisees, some of their leaders, took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk or embarrass him before the common people and thereby destroy his influence with them. Here's their plan. They sent some of their own people along with some uh, Herodians to ask him what they perceived to be a very difficult question. The Pharisees believed very strongly that it was oppressive and sinful to pay taxes to the Roman state under which they lived. And the Herodians believed just as extremely that it was sinful and wrong not to pay taxes. Well, they went together and asked Jesus, is it lawful to pay tribute or pay taxes to Caesar or not? 
If he answered yes, he'd certainly lose the favor and the following of the great masses of the common people. And if he answered no, well, he would incur the wrath of the Herodians, the government, Rome as well. But he didn't answer yes or no. He saw through their wicked scheme, and he simply asked for a coin with which they paid their taxes. Whose is the image of the superscription on it, he asked. And they said it was Caesar's. Then came the answer that once more sent them on their way. And not only that, but defined for all subsequent generations of disciples the relationship that we're studying today. Render, therefore, to Caesar the things that which are Caesar's, and to God the things which are God's. Notice now what he said. Number one, Jesus' disciples are citizens of two kingdoms while they sojourn here on this earth. That's God's kingdom and Caesar's kingdom. Number two, they have responsibilities in each of those kingdoms. Number three, these relationships and responsibilities are not to be confused or commingled. Number four, responsibilities in neither are fulfilled by total compliance to the other. And number five, God is praised by the faithful discharge of our duties both to God and to Caesar. Well, that seems to be clear enough, doesn't it? That isn't hard to understand, and we should never have any problem with that. We simply render to the state what's due the state and to God the things that are due him. But for some reason, it just doesn't appear all that simple when it comes to applying it. With some, there's still the idea that total submissive to one or the other is the only way we can bring glory to God. Well, the Apostle Peter, who knew firsthand what Roman persecution was all about, helps us keep our balance when uh, there seems to be some conflict between these two. He said, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, not yet not using your liberty as a check for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. That's 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17. So Peter argues that um, devotion to God is the true basis for good citizenship. And Christians praise the Lord by fearing God and by honoring the king. So now, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And should there ever be a conflict, Peter and the other apostles make it clear that we ought to obey God rather than men, Acts 5, 29. This is the way God is praised in the Christian and in the Christian life. You cannot honor God simply by being a good citizen, paying your taxes, obeying all the other laws, voting and all that, while ignoring your relationship to God. Likewise, you cannot be a good citizen simply by being baptized, becoming a good Christian, worshiping regularly, giving generously to support missionaries, living a quiet and peaceable life over on B Street all by yourself, and all of that. We Christians must decide that individually we're going to make a difference in this world during our sojourn here. That's why we're here, to live a life of meaning, a different kind of life than that of the unbeliever, the non-Christian out there in the world. But the devil doesn't care if you and I live saintly lives as long as we're not evangelistic about it. I mean, as long as we keep quiet and don't try to influence other people to do so. Then when we do that, he screams about it. And despite the fact that Christians are in better position to make a difference in those things, because they're considered social problems, some of us feel no responsibility toward them at all. And because of our non-involvement in them, 
These and a lot of other problems have grown to their present magnitude. Some are totally out of control and others are rapidly becoming so uh, that way. Election day coming up on November 2nd is a grand opportunity to serve God and government. Will the real Christian please stand up on that day? That's what's on the ballot. No, it's not whether you vote Democrat or Republican or Independent. It isn't your political party. Let me make that absolutely clear and plain. I'm talking about moral issues. Let your light shine, Jesus said, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Look around. Consider where the country has gone with some of us supposed to be Christians holding our position of non-involvement in the affairs of state. Most of us would think or prefer not to think of it, but our nation is on the decline. We're proud to be Americans. We have a rich heritage of noble principles and moral values. Many of us have fought and suffered and some have even died to preserve our American way of life. As one who's lived and traveled extensively abroad, I can speak from first-hand knowledge. America has been the envy of every nation in the world, not only because we are the freest people in the world and the most productive and prosperous, but because of the moral and ethical standards which uh, were the fabric of our society. Let's face it. That culture has given way to another less glorious. The America for and about which we've proudly sung, God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her with light from above, is locked in a life and death struggle for another less honorable way. Less honorable, I say, because it's perpetrated by a new order that's rejected the time modern traditional institutions and values which were the hallmark of our glory. The current importance being given to prosperity and pleasure has overshadowed the former values of family and character and loyalty and patriotism and honest labor. And this has created an atmosphere of selfishness and greed and dishonesty. I mean, lying and stealing and fornication and homosexuality and drugs and all of that sort of thing, which in turn have festered ugly, putrefying sores on our society, namely uncontrollable violence and corruption of public office. Such principles as the sanctity of human life, monogamous marriage, sexual purity, mutual respect for each other, personal integrity and honest labor and all of that have been trodden underfoot in reckless pursuit of unrestrained liberties and pleasures in this life. We booted God out of the classrooms of our schools and replaced him with gangs and guns and drugs. We've elected and appointed to high places in uh, government, the three branches of our government, people of counterculture, so that now our culture has become a subculture. Virtually everything Americans once held as sacred and dear is now under attack. More than 35 million little innocent, helpless babies, I mean human beings, have been legally killed in their own mother's womb and with her consent since that day in January 1973, a day that will live in infamy in American history. Is that right? Really guaranteed by the Constitution? If so, where? In what language? The reckless abandon of respect for the sanctity of human life can no longer be tolerated if America is to remain free and a prosperous nation. Roe v. Wade must be reversed, if not by Supreme Court order, then by the National Congress. Will the real Christian please stand up in the privacy of his voting booth for the 
person most likely to work through to the end of that. The family as God ordained it and defined it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. One man married to one woman for life is currently under attack. And many of our states will have a proposition on their November 2nd ballots to approve a state constitutional amendment to that effect. And Christian, here's your opportunity to stand up and be counted for God and for righteousness in the privacy of your voting booth. Some states also have a proposal to legalize various forms of gambling on their ballots. Greed is a most destructive form of evil to any society. Will the real Christian please stand up for God and country in the privacy of his voting booth on that question on November 2nd? Well, I have one more thought I feel I must share with you, but I want that to be the closing thought of the day, so don't go away. We'll have it after the prayer and the hymn. Father, we thank you for planting our feet here in this great country and letting us live here. And we pray that we'll assume responsibilities that are ours to make it a good place to leave for our children and our grandchildren after us. In Jesus' name, amen. The Old Testament prophet Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet of Israel. He worked and wept more than 40 years preaching a message of doom to his once proud homeland. His ministry was a sort of last ditch effort toward national repentance. It failed. Judah imploded. I mean, it collapsed from within because of the immorality and idolatry of the people. In the 18th chapter of his prophecy, Jeremiah wrote, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at a wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter says, the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up or to pull down, 
to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it if it does evil in my sight, so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good which I said I would benefit it. Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. Well, that's a good message for those good, honest folks who do nothing and keep on saying, oh, don't get yourself in a tizzy about all the evil in the nation. Everything's going to be all right because God is still in charge of the world, you know. Well, yes, he's in charge, but a nation of people may provoke uh, the Lord to anger and, and he'll relent of the good he's promised to do them. And because it no longer bears, uh, hears his voice, uh, he'll smite it with disaster. Another 9-11 incident, perhaps, or something even worse, complete captivity by a pagan nation, perhaps. Well, I'm not a prophet, and I'm not saying that's our destiny, but it is if we don't get ourselves turned around. Well, you've listened uh, through to this time, and I'm grateful. And if you'd like a free audio cassette tape or a free printed copy of this message to study it more, you may have it simply by writing In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma. You don't need to send money. It's free. Our email address is searchtv at aol.com, or you may use our toll-free telephone number to make your request, and that number is 1-800-321-8633. I said it's free. And we can give them away because this ministry is completely paid for by members of Churches of Christ across the nation, particularly in the community where you're hearing this message now. These are super nice people who would really like to have you pay them a visit for Bible study and worship. We'd like that too. And uh, if you'd like um, one of them to come by your house for a get acquainted visit uh, and, and a study of the Bible together with you, let us help you find them. We'd like to do that for you. But we won't send anybody by your house without your invitation. I'm glad you were with us today. I hope you'll do it again next, uh, next uh, week at this same time. Will you? God bless you now. We love you.